We acknowledge the land we work on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We encourage all of our audiences across Canada to learn about and acknowledge the territory you are on by visiting native-land.ca. Welcome to the 2022 Canadian Film Fest. It's the inaugural Making a Canadian Classic. I'm sitting here with my dear friend, but also one of the most iconic, amazing filmmakers in Canada, Sud Sutherland. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm great, thanks this is for it. This is first, this is like, it's this hard being first. first, right? But you, is... you know, uh, we, are, we will be talking about uh, Love, Sex and Eating the Bones. And I wanna, I wanna paint the picture. I wanna travel back to <laughs> September 6, to, uh, 2003. Uh, here's the landscape in, in, in that time. So uh, a month prior, August 14th was the Toronto blackout, right? Uh, Hurricane Isabel is a couple weeks away. So you've already dodged two catastrophes, all right? Uh, John Chrétien was prime minister. George W. Bush was president. They look absolutely stately now in these days. Uh, the number one movie in Canada was Pirates of the Caribbean. The number one song was Clay Aiken's Bridge Over Troubled Water. And in this world, you birthed Love, Sex, and Eating the Bones at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2003. Do you recall the premiere opening night? It was your first feature. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, you're just sort of as a filmmaker, you're like, you grew up in Toronto, you volunteer at the film festival as a youth. And so you're like, oh, this is what you want, right? Yeah. This is like Jennifer Holness, uh, the producer, mm -hmm. uh, co-writer of the story with me and uh, my wife and mother of our three children. Yep. Uh, we, we birthed this together and mm -hmm. it was a, a dream. And we wanted to, you know, have a Saturday night, you know. What theater uh, were you in? We were in, oh my God. We were in the, uh, damn, it was like, Varsity uh, or it was it was um, Cumberland. No, it was Cumberland. Cumberland. Okay, it was a Cumberland. Yeah, right. Oh my God, it was Cumberland. It was a Cumberland, and it was like this thing in theater in Yorkville. Yeah. It was back, back when everything was up at, at Yorkville. So it was like, okay, uh, this is the dream. And so we had a party afterwards, and it was great, and it was a great premiere, and and it was kind of a, the realization of a dream, uh, and you know your your dreams as a as a young filmmaker. And still today, you know, these are your dreams. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you, you were dreaming this a while because you and Jennifer came up with, so, you know, uh, going into deep suds uh, background, um, I, I noticed that a lot of your projects start with a, a question, a burning question. Where do all these guns come from? It becomes guns, right? You did a TED talk where you were talking about, does deportation equal death, right? It becomes home again. What was the spark question or how, you know, where did Love, Sex and Eating Bones come to you and Jennifer? <laughs> this was something that was surrounding us completely. Like it was like porn was surrounding us completely. 2003 and VHS, 2000, there was no internet, right? No it was internet, like, no internet. It's dial up internet. So sure. You, you'd get like, you'd dial up and then an image, like a still image would come like a, like three minutes later. Right. And so that was, it was before, you know, streaming porn. Sure. Stuff. You have to go Young Street to a store. <laughs> you have to, to torn, go. To corn, Cornucopia. 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 So yeah. you would have to actually go somewhere and you actually have to get something physical. So the thing was, is like, I'd had friends who like, you know, broke up with their boyfriends because he was addicted to porn. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? So like just getting into this sort of world was interesting. You know, I was saw my first porn when I was like 12 years old. Right. So I'm like, and I think every- Started young. Started right. young. I think every guy has, you know, a relationship with porn. Right. You know, and girls too, right? That's right. like, it's just ubiquitous now. Yes. But yeah. this was, we were kind of pioneers. If you're denying it, then you're just outright lying, right? Yeah, yeah. if you're denying it, you're just lying. Yeah. Come on. I yeah. mean, really, really. So we were like, I was like, okay, what's the end of this? Because I mean, I have my issues and I was like, mm, this is like, I knew this is not a good thing mm -hmm. to be so addicted to it. But it's like, okay, well, what's the end of this? So I made this like an extreme version of this about a guy who couldn't get it up right. without, you know, without the aid of porn. 
And that's like, now it's like a thing now, you know? But back then we were like, hey, what if this happened? Right. You know, and that was, that was, that was a question. And also wanting to make a romantic comedy with a real impediment. So you had like a, a woman who was not into porn and she was also celibate, you know? And, and so how would these two people sort of come together? That was the real, that was the question that we wanted to make a romantic comedy right. with a real impediment. And, and uh, you know, one of the first things when you, when you try to make a romantic comedy is what's the blocking character? What's the blocking thing? What's the thing that's keeping them from being together? What was, so Jennifer, and, and Jennifer, amazing filmmaker, producer, um, we're, we're going to talk about her in just a bit, but like you mentioned that you, you worked the story with her. Uh, and from what I know, Jennifer, she, she's a yin to your yang in terms of how you, you both operate. What were the conversations of developing that script? Like where were you both on the, there must've been uh, a perspective she had that was either um, complementary to yours or different when it comes to the story. I think the what we do together mm -hmm. is we bring a male and female energy mm -hmm. that I think is is really important for like a story like this. I think for all stories, but for for this particular story, because this this guy was going to be you know a porn addict, Michael, the main character. Right. He couldn't be like it couldn't be like a seedy you know back right. room kind of guy. Yeah. like you'd have that's to be too like, obvious. That's too <laughs> obvious, right? And like he'd have to be like a really charming. Dude, right? right? He'd have to be like, that would be sort of like, you, you love him in spite of this thing, right? So one of the things that we encountered as we were trying to pull this together, financing wise, people wanted to make it dark, 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 right. dark. And it was like, that was the whole sort of vogue at the time. And so we're leaving like- Leaving Las Vegas, right? That's right, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So we were like, actually, no, we didn't want to do that because I, that's not how I see life. That's right. not how I see, how I see Canadians. Everybody's warm and, right. and initially we pitched this movie as- and you're creating you know, a black experience. Why does it have to be that, right? Why does that have to be? You know, yeah. the, the thing is that we crafted this movie for people who like to kiss. Because yeah. everybody, <laughs> I like, how, who's this audience for? It's right. for people who like to kiss. Right. And that's what we would say. And so, um, because we wanted to uh, portray a story that everybody could fit in, but that was taking place in Toronto or Scarborough or wherever, right? So this is, this is again, a love letter to the city too. Right. Because we placed it in Toronto, we weren't saying it was anywhere else. Lamport Stadium, Queen Street. Absolutely. Like sp spaces like this, reclaimed warehouse spaces. Absolutely. Um, and as, you know, as you're putting it together, so I, try, I tried Googling uh, black Canadian romantic comedies <laughs> and you know, kind of started this whole thing off by saying, you know, you're, you're the first, you're the first to do this, um, you know, in, in conversation about a Canadian classic with the CFF. Um, was it the first black Canadian romantic comedy? Like, I, I'm trying to think of another, did, like, did you look into what came before you? Well, we didn't really, I mean, there wasn't. Like, right. there was like, there was, you know, like, Clement Virgo and Stephen Williams had done features. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of, we were fitting into this sort of mold, right? So, I mean, again, we're, you know, not to say that the black filmmakers are coming in and making films in right. this mold, but it's like this, these were our sort of antecedents. So yeah. we didn't, we were like, we just wanted to make a romantic comedy. We right. just ha wanted to make this film. Right. And so we just thought this would be something that people would want to see. I, what I loved, uh, you know, once it came out, and Jennifer actually said this in, a, in an article, um, you know, because it is about a security guard who has a porn addiction, and he, he can't be with the woman he loves because of that addiction. And um, there, was a, there was a great quote in a Star article that, that Jennifer said, it's like, because people were quite, were, came to you and questioned, it's like, why do you want to make this move, movie about black people with this weird sexual thing? Which is just odd to me because white filmmakers have been doing it all the time. Like you, you pick any romantic comedy, and there, there, you know, there is some sort of weird sexual hangup that you know comes into play. How important is it, or was it to you and Jennifer, to tell this story? Especially when you, you, you know, you're saying there's there's pressures from other people to drive it into what they thought was the lane you should be making, right? The, yeah. you know, how, why was that important? Well, I think that anybody wants to tell you what story to make yeah. as a filmmaker. <laughs> it's like, well, you should make a nice, tidy little story about, you know, black people who are 
you know, there what she works in advertising and and he's maybe a tradesman and, <laughs> and 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 he's 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 she's really uptight and he's going to loosen her up. Right. And, you know, that was the kind of that's the, that movie would be made like six times. Right. You know, but, and we're like we were so tired of this movie. Yeah, yeah. And so we're like, let's make it something different. Let's let's switch it up. So we were like, you know, we'd seen a lot of films coming out of America and to a lesser extent coming out of Britain, you know, uh, with you know, a, a little bit of romantic comedy, looking mm -hmm. at this kind of stuff, uh, looking at black characterization. So we wanted to do black characterization, uh, you know, of just human beings who right. were working and struggling and loving and right. making mistakes and fucking up and, you know, just being human, right? That had friends that were also fuck ups and Absolutely. doing their thing. And just people just, just messing, making mistakes through life and having fun and being young. And that's what we wanted to do. And so when people sort of said, well, you should represent a better version of blackness or represent a more sort of upscale version of blackness, we were like, oh, why? 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 You, you don't speak for every black Absolutely. person. I don't speak for every Japanese Canadian. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's like, no, we're not going to like, the, we're not the Obama version of, the, <laughs> you know, this is not aspirational politics. Yeah. So we just wanted to have some fun. Yeah. And we wanted to make a film and just have some fun and, and let's go. That's what, that's what the whole thing was. That voice, the, the authorship that you had in Love, Sex, and Eating the Bones, I remember we were talking in the preamble to, to start, start the, starting the cameras on this. I just remember it coming out at a time when Canadian filmmakers were really coming to their own. I mean, Mike Douse had just done FUBAR. Uh, you came out with this. Um, in 2003, uh, we made a very humble little $14,000 movie called Ham and Cheese um, that had Jen Baxter from your movie in it. So, there was this group of, of people, um, you know, uh, peers that were starting to make very specific things that they didn't, they didn't want to be told what to do, when to do it. Um, but this goes back to when you were a kid, right? I want to I say uh, five words to you. Coming of age in suburbia. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. So... You mentioned Scarborough, big up Scarborough, right? Uh, especially the film that's nominated this year uh, for CSAs, uh, big ups to Scarborough represent. But you grew up in Scarborough. Yeah. Um, and you were at a school um, that was doing a Victorian drama. <laughs> was that right? And it was all white casted, right? Because it's a Victorian yeah. period piece. Yeah, yeah. And what did you do? How did, how did that sit with you as a young Sud Sutherland? Well, as as a young son, so I was like, okay, well, I I'm, I was trying to you know be an actor on stage, and I tried tried out, didn't get in, and then this is grade this is like grade nine, okay, and then so, junior, yeah, I was like you know I was trying to go, I'm trying to be an actor, trying to do mm -hmm. that stuff, and then uh, I was like, okay, well, I'm you know, uh, and I was like, okay, oh my God, there's a raisin in the sun. This was a completely black cast, right? You know, and I was like. Okay, that's that's for me. <laughs> that's for you. That's this is okay. I get it. That's for, for you me. and the other black student that's in your class. Absolutely. <laughs> this is like we're all gonna get cast. Awesome. I'm gonna be on stage. Great. So I don't get in that. And so I'm like, wow. oh shit, I must be a shite actor. So I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna write my own play. <laughs> right. So I thought it was like, okay, it's Victorian era. It's total racism. Da da. I'm like, no, I'm just not a very good actor. Right. <laughs> so I I just I write a play that I'm gonna cast myself as a lead. And then, so I give it to, you know, the best director in the, in the school. And then I'm like, you know, he doesn't say anything for a couple of days. And I'm like, I, I, hey, come on, dude, like, what, how is it? And he's like, well, it's, it's okay for a black play. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Black God. play? What are you talking about? Right. I didn't have any, like, there was no microaggression or language sure. like that. That wasn't, that wasn't. You thing. were just writing a play because you wanted play. to be in it. I just yeah. wanted to be in it. So yeah. I was like, black play, what are you talking about? So I was like, uh, you know what? I'm going to direct this myself. Right. So I got a book on directing plays from the <laughs> school library. You know, it was like probably like 1964. Right. You know, it's like one of the <laughs> directing plays. And, you know, it was like, you know, ridiculous. And you can hear the soundtrack in the, in the, in the, in the writing. So. I got a book. And then I just started like just making lists, like what we would do. Like we'd make a list of all the props we need. We'd make a list of all, all the wardrobe. That lighting we need. changes. The lighting yeah. changes. Just making lists, like doing it over and over and over again. Just the same way that we do now with the call sheet and all that other Shot stuff. Shot list, yep. All that stuff, but just doing it in sort of an, like just sort of intuitively, like at, at grade 10, right? 
And so there was this thing called Rookie Drama, put it in that, and then also put it into the Sears Drama Festival. Sears, I'm an alum. Absolutely. We lost out, we did a hard hitting prison drama play called One Tiger to a Hill, and we lost to a uh, musical called Reduce, Recycle, and Reuse. <laughs> Oh, there you God. go. Um, but your uh, play became Coming of Age in Suburbia. Yeah. And it also had a young Ed Robinson, Robertson that um, from the Bare Naked Ladies that uh, was one of your friends at the time. Uh, he's still a friend. Still, and, and, and is in is Love, Sex, and Eating the Bones. Love, Sex, and Eating the Bones. And he, was, he played my father. And, in the play. In the play. <laughs> and this is the first early colorblind casting. Okay. Uh, and Brenda Camino at, at, uh, in Toronto, um, and I think she was at Cahoots Theatre. She kind of was one of the local pioneers of colorblind casting. Right. I recently had a, a chance to work with her at, in Carter. Oh, amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was, uh, I told her, like, you're amazing. Right. And you were, like, my inspiration. Influential, yeah. And she's like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, but that was a, our first sort of foray into, like, that's my first foray into, like, directing. Right. Was, uh, and that was, that gave me the encouragement because we did, well at Sears in terms of like, they it encouraged, it, it went on and blah, blah, blah. I didn't win or anything like that, but it, it, it went off and and we did some, uh, what is it? We went and do, did a tour of like schools in wow. Scarborough and, wow. and different places like Sharon, Ontario. And like people had invited us and, and people actually commissioned to play like they their schools, like put it on and all that kind of wow. stuff. Wow. So that early sort of encouragement. That's huge. That's huge. It was huge, like, it was huge. Thinking back to my high school days in the Sears mm -hmm. Drama Festival, that is the gold ring that you hope your your play yeah. gets. Yeah, you just, it was just it was fun to get that early encouragement, and so that was um, that was what kind of spurred me on to say, oh, I could make a living at this, right. maybe. Uh, well, you, you you do more than just make a living, but I, I want to keep on this timeline because the next stop I want to bring you to is uh, you go to York University. Somehow you figure out that film is for you. Uh, you end up at York University and you meet a, a woman there named Jennifer Holness. And I want to get this story right because I'm, I'm trying to cobble, cobble it together. Um, you were there uh, and you never graduated, right? <laughs> I didn't graduate. I failed Ryerson Film School. So, you know, I feel that. Well, there you know, we are. Yeah, there we there are. We, are. There <laughs> we, we got that thing that's <laughs> happening. Um, you meet this uh, woman named Jennifer Holness who was on a fast track to Osgood Hall. Like she was smart and she had her shit together. Um, but something happened. I want to say she had an aneurysm and you literally saved her life. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's her story to tell, but she, like we were just at home at her house and she complained of like just something in her eye. She felt some paralysis, wow. which was very odd. And then it was like this massive headache. And then I was like, lie down. And then I was like, this is weird, 911. And this is like peak Harris cutback years. Right. So uh, huh. the yeah. ambulance comes and he's and she's like, oh, I feel better now. And then the guy's like, oh, it's probably just a migraine, the ambulance guy. And I'm like, where is your CAT scan right. machine? Yeah. And so I'm like, no, you're taking the ambulance. We're going. And he's like, no, you don't need to go. I'm like, no, we're going and we're taking the ambulance. And this again, this is like, again, like this is a black woman, yeah. they're like- You like need to be so, an advocate. You have yeah, to have an advocate. Yeah, yeah. You have to have an advocate because they'll talk you out of, yeah. you know, saving your own life. Yeah. So we, we went to the hospital. By that time, she was like in agony. Wow. And then it was like, ER was like a high, like at its peak at mm -hmm. that moment, right? And so- I'd learned so much from watching ER. <laughs> and so I swear to God. I'm not a doctor, but I've seen one on I've TV. Seen one on, <laughs> and then so she was screaming in pain. And then she's like, and then I, can you do anything for the pain? And the resident was like, um, uh, I can't give her a narcotic because she might slip in a coma. I'm like, what about a non-narcotic? What about Demerol? Wow. And then he's like, oh, okay. And, then, <laughs> and she gave her Demerol and calmed right. her pain down. Right. But we, you know, and then she, it was like, a, I could see like that was a subarachnoid hemorrhage on the CAT scan. Oh my God. And I could see it, I could yeah. see the bleed. And so I was like, okay, she's gotta go to Toronto Western. And my friend, Jim Chung, who was a, who's like the uh, head doctor of Air Canada now. Wow. Um, he is like, um, he was taking classes with this guy, Dr. Gentili. Okay. The doctor who's like the number one, like aneurysm guy in like North America. And he was like, he was her doctor. Wow. And saved her life. Wow. Um, uh, Again, 
I bring this up only to, to to tie in how important you two are together. You know, you look at the the trajectory of your career and the things you've done. Uh, uh, so much has been in concert and in collaboration with Jennifer, and it started uh, with this moment, which um, is much more serious than it looked like when I was reading it. Um, why is it important to be with a, a, a creative other, with someone that is part of your creativity? Why is it important to you? I kind of like, it just sort of happened. Like it didn't, it did, it wasn't intending. I wasn't intending for that at all. It was like, she was just hanging out. I was doing a, you know, short films, music videos. And she's like, oh, I could hang out this weekend. Sure, sure. I'm like, you want to, cause I'm not, I'm unavailable this weekend. You want to come and hang out? And she just started hanging out and then she just enjoyed it because she always enjoyed it as a child. Right. She would be at the bookmobile. I don't know if you remember the bookmobile, yeah, yeah, but she yeah. like the bookmobile would come to the, you know, the ghetto <laughs> and that was where you get you. That's yeah, where you get, get the, the books. books. Yeah. And so yeah. her and her sister like took out like 20 books wow. and read them like, and then when the bookmobile came back the next week, uh, you know, we get 20 more. And so that's how she grew up right. and just like finding herself in stories. And as a young black girl, she wasn't really encouraged to write or, right. or do anything like that. And it wasn't like I was encouraged to write until I, I just, I would write and then I'd write short stories and stuff. And then I'd give them to my friends to read. Uh, and then it just, people began to want to read them because it would be sort of thinly disguised gossip. Was you know? acting your <laughs> first passion? Was, was, did you, yeah, did you I, have the bug for that? And well, you started I'd, writing because you I'd, couldn't? I loved writing from like day one. So right. grade one, my mother had like a Smith Corona right. uh, typewriter a portable typewriter. So I right. would write on that. But uh, acting, I always wanted to act. Mm -hmm. But like, and that was like, you know, grade one, just started being, you know, a, a kid mm -hmm. in tights playing in Jack in the Box or some shit like that. Like that was <laughs> what I, what you know, it's what you do. But I think um, the, in answer to your question, um, we just sort of fell into that. Right. And it was like, you know, we both like really love telling stories. And I think that, you know, our documentary work, yep. um, you know, is something that like very close to our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, and so we like doing that, but we also like telling, um, you know, dramatic stories. We like telling comedic stories. We just love telling stories. Um, uh, I want to talk about uh, the documentary work. Um, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about Love, Sex and Healing Bones. Now that we know um, Jennifer a little bit more, now that we know you coming through school and uh, part of the uh, the uprising of, of going against the man is is writing your own shit so you can do it yourself. Um, with Love, Sex, and the Bones, um, there's some key dialogue. And it's not that I want to know who wrote it, but I want to know, because when I saw it, so I saw it in 2004. And I want to say I saw it either um, uh, at the backstage or the car, I saw it, maybe even the Cumberland. I, I saw it in Toronto. And I remember, um, you know, just the struggle that your main character, Michael, was going through was such an artist struggle, right? It's, it's and, and there's some key dialogue in it that um, for me resonated. Um, and and uh, come back when you're ready. You have the talent, but if you challenge yourself more and, um, uh, I want my eyes back. So come back when you're ready. I mean, now, and, and I, you know, to prepare for this conversation, I rewatched Love, Sex, and the Human Bones. <laughs> Everybody should watch it. it. I got it on Apple TV. So just go out there and rent it, buy it, whatever. See the movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, I should have had a disclaimer that there's going to be spoilers in this conversation because we're going to be <laughs> talking about it. But um, uh, this young artist, now watching it um, uh, years and years later, how much of that was you at the time when people would say, yeah, you're not ready? <laughs> oh, it was a lot of it. I mean, there was, um, it was a lot. Like it was like, I've heard those words, right? I mean, that, those, those words stink, right? And so I remember we'd done a, a like we try to get a calling card short. Right. The OMDC had this thing. Sure. Ontario creates now, yes. but it was all yes. NBC back then. Yes. And it was like a half hour and it was like a calling card short and we were so geared up for it. And we'd done a lot of like, you know, smaller short films, mm -hmm. self-financed, all of them, right? 
And so in gearing up to do like a half hour. Was this uh, before or after uh, my father's hands? This is what we came to the calling card program with. Okay. Right. And so we said, this is what we want to do. And this script, the script was done. Right. Right. So we had the script and had like, you know, this is what we, you know, we just want to do. And then so they'd had a jury, like Laura Michael was there, you know, all (laughs) these, you know, all these, all these folks. And then. So they then um, called Jennifer and they didn't, I guess they, they knew I was on the other line or whatever, but like, uh, it was like, I, I'm not going to say her name, but w- later on this woman, we actually hired her to do business affairs at, you know, but she said, um, <laughs> he's, guys? yeah, I don't guys. <laughs> we're not, we're, she's not ready. He's just not ready. Right. Your director is not ready. Wow. The longest thing he's done is 10 minutes long and he's just not ready for this too big for him. Right. And he's not ready for this. And I'm like, I wanted to say some shit because I was on the other line listening. I'm like, Argh. but that was like fuel, right? Like right. anytime anybody tells you you can't do shit, yeah. you fuel. want to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's like fuel. So that was the fuel. So we got like Canada Council money, Ontario Arts Council money, and like w- like won prizes for some of the short films. Cobbled it all together, pulled in all the favors we had, and we shot it over a week in the first week of March in um, in, in I think it was '99 or something. So that was what we did, and so but that was fuel. And then later on, I talked to Laura Marcus and she was like, oh, that was the one that got away. We always feel bad about that one. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but you know, like, but having, you know, her lieutenant say, oh, he's not ready. He's not ready. Right. That burned it like into my brain. And I was like, that was some of the things that fueled the writing of that because it was right. a, very much about an artist who was like stuck in a limbo mm-hmm. and, and trying to break out of it. And he, he does it in a way that I thought was very, uh, you know, in 2003, um, organic uh, with his photography, right? Uh, I want to talk about taking up space because um, we were talking about, you know, of all the things you could have done at that time, why make this romantic comedy about a weird sexual hangup? Um, and, the, and the reality is, well, that's every romantic comedy, right? So you put, um, what I would call at that time aspirational characters in it, they're artists. He's a photographer. She's at a, she is at a marketing firm, um, but has aspirations to do other things. Um, you know, why did you make those decisions as a writer and directorially, why did you um, uh, direct Hill in a way to make him so accessible, you know, to, to an audience that might not be ready for a black guy hung up on porn. I mean, you just made it so that you could watch it and you got it, right? How did you go down that uh, route? We'd gone through like a number of iterations about like just who Michael was. Right. And in the beginning, he was very like, very much very male, mm-hmm. you know? And so we wanted to inject some sort of feminine characteristics in mm-hmm. him because we needed to have that yin and yang that you're talking yep, about yep. because he had to have and be a bit, b- bit more in touch with his female side. Yes. And so that was something that was an iter- iterative process to get there. Also the characterization of Hill Harper to get Hill Harper right. um, was something that like, again, that was like some like crazy, to get him in the movie, to get him in the movie, yeah, to get him interested yeah. in this material. It, it had to be something that he could sink his teeth into right. because uh, a star again, like he was like, on the come up at that moment, CSI, all yeah, that stuff. All He's that stuff before all that CSI. I stuff, know, but like just before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was like, so it was he was a get. So it was like to get him to get say yes, mm-hmm. that we had to have a role that was going to challenge him mm-hmm. comedically because he had to hit all the notes. Mm-hmm. But he, there had to be some substance there for him. So we 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 had to craft it. And again, I think that every director, every writer has to craft roles that actors die to play, yep. want to play. Yep. Because it's not about the money at that point. It's like, I want to play this part yep. and I'll move things in my schedule to play this part. Right. Because, but as long as you can get it to them. Because I think I still think that actors are, are, are into that. Yes. Um, as opposed to the money. Yes. Right. Um, and the character of Jasmine, uh, you know, when, you, when you're talking about this sort of nuance to a character, um, to get Marlon uh, Barrett um, what, what were you looking for in terms of uh, who your Jasmine was going to be and how did you get her to be interested uh, in the film as well? We, I mean, to... Because it is, you know, it's, it's a complex role. It's a hard one because um, 
you know, f for those of you that uh, are watching the movie right now because you just rented it, uh, she's, she said she's celibate for two years as a choice. Mm -hmm. And then meets this guy and is like, fuck, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm good to go. So tell me, tell me the process of bringing her character in the we, writing process. We had to like flesh that character out mm -hmm. because we had to make her, it was, a, for, uh, for me, it was like a dual protagonist story. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to have these two people, you know, I mean, it's more about Michael, but it, it is also about Jasmine. And so we wanted to have her have her own arc and have her desires and dreams. And, and, and she had to get to a place that was real for her. So we crafted the, you know, again, because it's the two of us, because Jen is like very, very strong woman. Uh, we wanted to make sure that, that for the female audience, it was going, there was going to be some for her to sing, for them to sing their seat into. Mm -hmm. So crafting it and then putting a call out because we call LA, Vancouver, right. New York, yeah. Toronto, Montreal, we shout out, like we had like 300 like right. tapes, 300 right. women audition. And my, like, she was like off the boat. Like she was like amazing. She came out of New York. She's from Montreal. She was a VJ on Music Plus. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah she yeah. was a VJ on Music Plus. And so she was living- I remember in Monica Diol. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> that was my time. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Monica Diol, yeah. absolutely. So she um, she was in New York, mm -hmm. uh, going to school, working, working as an actor. Uh, and then so she drove like 12 hours uh, to, to, for a, a read with Hill. Wow. Wow. She drove herself and she came in sweats and so like a lot of, you know, actor, actors, when they come in, they're like, you yeah. know, they send in their, as Hill says, they send in their representative. Sure. So they, they come in and like, like dressed in the nine right. makeup, all right. that kind of stuff. She had no makeup on. And then she came in sweats. Right. And then she just like blew us off. The Laid screen, it like, off. Yeah. Blew us off. And yeah. Hill was like, mm hmm Right. Mm hmm Right. And it was, it was great to see them in that moment. And that's a cold read. Right. And, but it was like, it was very clear that we had like found our Jasmine. Uh, and... For me, my favorite scene in the entire movie is the confrontation. This is a scene, again, spoilers, but we're talking about making a Canadian classic. About an hour and 13 minutes into the film, there's a scene where they're, they're you know, they've been trying to consummate this relationship for a while, but this scene was so raw and so real. I remember watching it in the theater going, this is, this is excellent filmmaking. This is like you crafted it uh, in, in, a, in, in such a way. And it comes out kind of as a surprise because its tone was very, like it just, if you had um, a, a, a sexual desire for porn and you were in a real relationship, that would be the scene that I, I'd want to see. How did you craft, like, let's talk about craft. How did you block it? How did you like? How did you work the scene to make it so real for the audience to experience? We had to um, put it at the sort of the end of the schedule, towards the end of the schedule. After they've been through a bunch After of stuff. After they've been yeah. through and had a relationship, because that was like something I really wanted to to do. Right. So we shot a lot of the exteriors first, sure, because um, it was. Cold. cold. <laughs> <We've> His <laughs> Hill's nose is completely red in the harbor front scenes. Absolutely, absolutely. He is like, like he's like he, a red nose on a black man. <laughs> absolutely. We were like heading towards Christmas, so right. we shot those those beach beach scenes in the first week of December. Wow. So it was um, kind of crazy like that. But in terms of um, we 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 had to plot like just in terms of like chronologically. Um, put them at, 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 so they had a, a bit of time, like three weeks or so, to get to know each other, uh, and then so blocking wise in on the on the day, um, wanted to keep it raw, mm -hmm. wanted to keep it honest, mm -hmm. and so we didn't really over rehearse it. Right, like we were like, okay, let's kind of go here, and 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 okay, as you as you you're not engaging, you're not looking at at her. You're was there rehearsal at, before this, or was just? No, on the day. Well, there was. There okay. was rehearsal. We rehearsed like we had a couple of days of rehearsal to get to know you. Okay. Uh, was so, this scene part of that rehearsal? No, it was not. Okay. No, Purposely? Not. Purposely. Yeah. Wanted to keep it fresh. Like yeah. one of the like that's a good. That's a good choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like one of the scenes that we did rehearse, and I had a very clear understanding of rehearsal, uh, or, or why I wanted to rehearse them. Is, laundromat is the laundromat was one yeah. absolutely, but the, the 
when all four of them are together, like just at the school bus, school bus, when the school bus arrives, <laughs> and then the four of them are together, yeah, yeah. like it really, I wanted to have, I, because hellos are so awkward, yeah, but it was like, you know, like, okay, because we also did recraft some dialogue at that point, sure. So it was like, okay, well, we, um, what do you see? Like, because Hill didn't want to rehearse the, 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 he's like, no, this is ridiculous. Why are we rehearsing it? This scene is ridiculous. So, but he needed to see her. Right. And see how beautiful she was. Right. Because she dressed up. Right. And then, First time. Yeah. And then yeah. like, because I was like, no, no, wait a second. What do you see? Yeah. And then he's like, ah, okay. <laughs> okay. I see you. Uh, such see a good you. game. Yeah. Because then he's like, okay, okay. I see you are, you are thinking about this. Yeah. So then he like sort of began to respect me as a director. Yeah. So then he like said, okay. And then just like the f like look on his face when he just like sees her, it just like, yeah. And so those are those kind of moments that you kind of like, there may not be there on the page, right. but because you can't put them all in the page, yep. but if, if you can sort of direct it and, and make it real, yes. because the first time you see somebody who's dressed up, who yep. you really like, yeah. there's a, there's it's, a it's visceral yeah, reaction. Absolutely. Yeah. And it goes throughout your whole body. Yeah. And so when you can craft that and make that for somebody, it's like, okay, yeah. And then, and make that real for an actor because that affects his physiology, her physiology, the other people in the scene feel like yeah, yeah. it affects them all. So those are things I live for as a director, as a, as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. as a, as a, as a participant in this, like just conjuring that up. Right. That's what I live for personally. Um, uh, the Canadian film fest, uh, thanks, uh, DGC Ontario for sponsoring this conversation. And part of what I want to talk to you about is the craft of directing. And, and thank you for that. Um, I always, I don't know if I'm using my rehearsal time correctly. You know, I just don't <laughs> know. And, and what I came to um, understand is it's not so much about putting the, 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 uh, the scene up on its feet. It's to gain the trust of your actors. And you just mentioned, you know, um, there's a little bit of test from Hill maybe. How, you know, how, how do you as a director, uh, and let's jump forward now, we're gonna fast forward to now, you are one of the premier episodic directors in television, uh, working everywhere um, uh, on uh, Super Lois and Superman and um, uh, uh, DC. When you go onto a new show, do you find that the cast tests you a little bit of you know, who you are and what, what you're made of? And how do you react to that? Like, what do you do as a director to prepare yourself for that? I think um, what you, you, they all do. They all <laughs> test you. They're all like, so where am I again? And like, cause like, they're like, oh, what am I doing here? Yeah. And like, and you just like go the moment before the, yeah. last scene, the last scene, you had, you know, just beaten up your son or whatever, or whatever. So, and then just, just to give them that, just to make sure that they, they want to know that you've read the scene. Yeah. Right. And, and you've read the, the script. Yeah. And, and oh, also, they probably don't even know what episode they're doing right now because they have like four scripts in their heads, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So they want to make sure that you know yeah. what you're doing and what you want them to do. Because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, okay, great. And then so they just really remember. But they also want to make sure that you have, know that they're talk you're talking to an artist mm -hmm. and that they're not just a meat puppet mm -hmm. in, in, in your eyes. Yeah. And so that's one thing I like to do is also I kind of tend to follow them on on Instagram right. before like uh, I, I get the job. Yes. I, I, I like to see what they read, on, you know, what, what they're on Twitter. Yeah. See, I like to look at all the episodes of the show as much as I can. Yep. If it's like a 20 year eight, show. Eight, eight season, 10th season, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't, but like yep. maybe the last two seasons. Yep. Um, and, but I think that, or key, key moments, like if you ask the showrunner mm -hmm. uh, in when you, you get hired, you're like, okay, well, what are the key episodes yeah. that I should in, in yeah. the in the sort of in the mythology of it all? Yeah. What are the key episodes I should be watching? Yes, and they're they're great because they're They'll like oh four hundred one three eighteen da 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 yeah. they can rhyme it off and they want those episodes again this season they want that level of excellence right yeah they're looking for that absolutely um, in what so now traveling back to uh, two thousand two two thousand three when you're making love sex and eating the bones. Um, your first feature. What, do you remember the challenges you had working with actors in a feature for the first time? What, do you well, actors and crew. Yeah. What <laughs> were some of those, what were, yeah. And Arthur, Arthur uh, Cooper, your longtime collaborator, uh, was a DP. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, you, know, you, you look at the, the crew list, a litany of uh, Jonathan Duick, uh, just amazing uh, mm -hmm. uh, people that worked on it. 
Oh, it was great. But it was like, there, we, we also had some the malcontents because it was like, a lot of people didn't believe what we we're doing. Yes, low like, budget too, right? Low so, budget, so, low yeah, budget. Yeah. So it was like, literally like, there's a lot of people who had no faith in this. They thought it was garbage. They mm -hmm. thought it was like, what am I working on? It was terrible. Right. And it was like a tough time. Like every like night coming home, I was like, I was like, I don't like doing this. We'd be getting like 14 setups, 15 setups. It was like, we were like yeah, it was like really, really bad. We were like, I was. Were you doing like to, seven, eight page days, or I was doing like, yeah, I was like yeah. that. It was like, but it was like, but you know, moving slow, moving slow. Right. These guys were like slow as molasses. Right. And In like, context, we're kind of used to twenty five to thirty, right? As a as a barometer. As, as a just gen, thirty two is usually what you're doing. Sure. And it's like that's kind of twenty five to thirty two, yeah. right? Yeah. That's generally the ballpark. Yeah. yeah. But it's like that's what we're the kind of pace I'm more used yeah. to now. But back then. It was like, what is going on right. here? It was like people were like trying to get overtime and shit like that. It right. was like it was like a bad, okay. bad situation made worse by everybody. There's a lot of negative energy. Right. First time director. Right. They didn't. The guy knew what I was doing. Right. Blah blah blah. No faith in the script. Blah blah blah. blah. So it was like it was like we. It was Jen and I and Arthur, you know, right. and Jonathan. Yeah. Like against the world. Right. Right. And it was like we were like really trying to get everybody on side and like, come on guys, let's go. We're, Put on a play, you know, <laughs> like, put on a show, guys. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. We're going to save the barn, save the school. <laughs> like, you know, that was the whole thing. But it was like, honestly, there was a lot of negative energy. So it was like we had to power through that stuff. And so in, in so doing, like the, the, those challenges working with actors, because Hill is like, you know, a, a bigger actor at yep. the time. Yep. And like he had to have faith. And he was this, he was a set leader. Yeah. Right. He was the one who, of us who had the most experience. Yep. And he was like. He's true number one. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. True number one. Yeah. He'd been in Spike Lee's films. Yeah. He's, he's like, you know, and he's also like working as kind of a mentor to me because yeah. like, I'm like, is this normal? I was like, <laughs> I was like, dude, is this normal? Cause this, this set thing. And he goes, you know, Spike Lee's his own first AD. So you got to get this going, man. Yeah. You got to get this go get, get your setup numbers going. Cause he yeah. was like, he knew how many setups we were right. getting. He's so, like, where's my close up? I know. I, I know. I need my close up right now. <laughs> Seriously. Cause I was like, there was one moment where it, it's like literally just his face. Yeah. And so he wanted like 10 tries of that. Sure. No, when he's yeah. talking to camera, right? Talking to yeah, camera. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, he wanted 10 I, tries I, uh, of that. I love black people. I think that was the line, right? When he. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, throughout I, the whole I, I thing. Hate <laughs> yeah, I hate black people. I love black people. I hate black people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was like, for him, he wants yeah. his close up, he yeah. wants those moments. So when you're working with a star, you have to deliver that stuff yeah. and create time and a schedule for that. So that was, again, that was, he was teaching me that, those things as well. Yeah. Um, Talk about teaching a little bit. Um, we, we, we were talking about advocacy and um, I want to I want to fast forward. I, I know it's it's kind of um, I, I only have a, a certain amount of time with you because you're actually in the edit right now for a phenomenal series called Black and Origin Story. And I, I just you know, you were talking about your documentary work earlier in the, in the projects you do with your uh, partner, uh, Jennifer Holness, Black and Origin Story. Um, I was uh, able to watch the first episode, which everybody should watch right now. Um, and uh, two episodes are out, right? Um, and by the time you see this, hopefully all four will be out. So uh, find this because it's required viewing. Um, there's a line uh, uh, about it that uh, I think you said, you have to be an advocate for your history. You have to be an advocate for your history. And that, that really hit home with me because after watching that first episode, you reinvent the syllabus of uh, history for Canadians to watch. How, how do you go from your first feature, Love, Sex, and the Eating Bones, which, you know, some people might look at as a, 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 a sexy comedy rom-com. I saw it as like, it's hard to be first. You did something that no one else did. That is incredibly hard. Fast forward now to 2022, and you're coming out with, I think, one of the most seminal um, TV series ever made in this country for Canadians to watch. How do you get there from point A to point B? What, what, what brought you to this point to be an advocate, not just for your stories, but for history? I think um, we'd done a film after uh, my father's hands called Speakers for the Dead. Yes. It was with the National Film Board. And so this was like a competition and it was like a, to do a half an hour film. And so we'd come across 
uh, story about black history in Priceville, Ontario, or South, Southwestern Ontario, on the way to Owen Sound. Mm -hmm. So this was a story about a black community of people who you know, fought in the War of 1812, loyalists, black loyalists. Right. And so they'd settled in this place called Priceville. And so fast forward to around Confederation time, they did store, church, school, you know, and a community, but they were not given any deeds at the time. Right. So Scottish and Ir Irish settlers who had get, been given deeds ran them off the land. And these, these black loyalists came to Canada thinking they were going to get title and be free. Absolutely. And they were sold a bill of goods. So we'll build good. So they cleared the land, they did all this stuff, but they were never given deeds. Right. And so what happened was, again, Scottish and Irish settlers come in, forced off, they forced them off the land through violence sometimes, but also through marriage. Like, mm -hmm. So they sort of absorbed, you know, the black people became white. And, but right. Th right. the truth is that a lot of the black folks who came were very, very light. Uh, okay. So they could pass for white, some of them. Right. So, but this is, this is what we're talking about. So yeah. that was the, sort of the seed for us because we'd never known anything about Canadian black history. We were right. we never taught any of this stuff in school. So it was like we it was like the Underground Railroad and they lived <laughs> happily ever after. Right. La, la, la. right. That was it. Yeah. And so we began to look at primary sources like census, like you know, church records, like the Book of Negroes. Kind of, the Book of Negroes, yeah. all these like primary sources. And then we be, began to like be a, a you know uh, sort of acquainted with guys like Lawrence Hill. Lawrence Hill was we met him during the research for, for uh, Speakers for the Dead. Right. And, and we met him at an emancipation, emancipation Day picnic. Wow. And, so, and we've been friends ever since. So like, this is like how we begin to do this question. And in, in talking with him, like, he would sort of teach us about like, a little bit of black history. Oh, look at this person, or go here, go here. And so we began to learn about it. And then so we've wanted to get back to this for a long time, but like, it's been really hard to get anybody interested in it. And then at one point, Chorus called and said, okay, are you guys got anything to pitch? And this is after, after George, George Floyd. Floyd yeah. And that was a significant element because uh, in this because the door was open. His yeah. murder opened the yeah. doors you know, for this, uh, especially in Canada, yeah. so like and all over the world. So we got an opportunity to pitch them. They said, okay, it's in, that's interesting because where did the first black Canadians come from? Mm -hmm. And so we began, uh, they said, okay, cool, but we wanted Black History Month uh, 2022. And we're like, no, that's crazy. <laughs> right. We can't do that. This story is too big. This story is too big. Yeah. So we said, okay, we, we, we organize it around regions. Right. And then we do smaller stories. Right. And then with an idea of like, okay, we'll do this, but it's not going to be a survey documentary of like right. all the black history in Canada. That's not possible. So we wanted to base it around regions. And so that's how we began the idea of be okay, an origin story. And so uh, it's Nova Scotia, yes. Quebec, Ontario, BC. and BC. Right. Uh, you start the first episode is about Nova Scotia, and uh, I've I've been very fortunate to spend time in Halifax and Truro, where we do <laughs> Trailer Park Boys. But there is a region uh, in Nova Scotia, amazing region called Preston, uh, and uh, you go into depth of uh, how this area was created. Um, what, you know, David George, the line from David George, uh, who was a, a former slave, a black loyalist, became a preacher, and he um, baptizes a white woman. And this sets off everything that happened in that area. As a storyteller, how, how much responsibility do you have to tell this story? Because you can draw a direct line to George Floyd, Ahmaud, uh, Ahmaud Arbery. Um, uh, you know, uh, wh what is the responsibility for you to do this? I think I, I think the responsibility to do this is is total. I think that like Jennifer, you know, directed Halifax, and and she set it out like from the beginning when we were talking about this series. We are doing something. It's for the long game. It's not just for the ratings. Of, yeah. Of, of the night it premieres, it's not, those Those aren't the ratings. This will be used in schools. schools this, will be, yeah. this will become part of the canon. And so we have to A, get it right, yeah. and we have to dig deep and actually uh, ask hard questions. Yeah. So, you know, the David George example, that sets off 10 days of rioting. People are killed, you know, and, and in terms of like the, the local economy, um, whites are being undercut because blacks are forced to, to go for pittance. Like right. uh, the wages have to be like- They're, they're one, basically, yeah enslaved again once they are you know supposedly granted freedom once they come here 
Absolutely. And we wanted to be honest and be witnessed and be uh, authentic to our ancestors. We wanted to honor our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so we understand that they are looking at this, that their descendants are looking at this, and that their, and their descendants will be looking at this in time. So we have to get this story right. And so we, we had to do our research. We had to, you know, be, you know, and, and show this to the experts and say, is this correct? Or, you know, like, and then we've had like notes and get with notes on, on notes. Right. And is this map correct? Should we use this map? Or, right. You know, th that stuff, we have to do that stuff. Getting people's names right, all that kind of stuff. Right. We have to do that stuff because again, it's gonna stand, if it's gonna stand this test of time, yep. it has to be authentic. It has to be accurate. So. Um, you not only uh, have experts, you have the, you have the people in it. You have the colleagues in it. You, you know, there's there's an amazing scene in that first episode where it's the reunion and they're they're all walking around in their t-shirts, uh, the the, the Cauley family reunion. And, um, you know, this these stories ex never existed. I, I think I think you said once, you know, you can't blame the teachers for not teaching it. They didn't know. They just didn't know that this was here. Um, where do you, where do you see? Where do you see this going? Where do you see storytelling? Where do you see re-educating Canada? Uh, where do you see it moving in, in light of reconciliation, in light of George Floyd? Well, I was, um, I was thinking of a story you told me about your parents, about the internment, um, the internment camp. Yeah. And I was thinking about this as I was approaching this interview. And I'm thinking like, I remember you telling me these stories and I was like, I never heard those right. stories. I didn't hear this. Yeah. And that all like totally affected the rest of your parents and your yeah. life. Yeah. And so I think I want to know that. Yeah. Like I want that story told and I want to see it in school. Mm -hmm. I want to see that story in school. I want to understand, again, this, this is a very complex country. This is a huge country. Yes. But we, I think it's the best country on the planet. That's why we live here, yeah. right? We had opportunities to go to we states. We have failures, we have problems, but uh, we're moving forward. Absolutely, yeah. and we have to. And it's like, and, and if we don't look at the failures of our past, then how are we going to learn? And how are we going to make this country uh, and, and big enough for everybody to achieve their dreams in? Right. So that's one of the reasons why we, you know, why we sought to do this. Like in terms of every one of these. Uh, every one of these uh, shows, we always are also looking at our indigenous brothers and sisters because we need, yes, yes. We, we have to talk about- You have to tie story. in the black experience with who was there. Absolutely, because yeah. yeah. they were here, they've been here yeah. since time immemorial. Yeah. So we have to be on, have we have to honor that about Northern Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that in all of the episodes. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is that in all, if we are going to honor our ancestors, because there's a lot of black indigenous folks out yeah. there. Yeah. And so we wanted to honor them too. Shout so, out Adeline Bird, who absolutely. is a phenomenal filmmaker. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have to, we, we have to honor that. So again, like when, as we're beginning to compile, uh, to, to make this right. and to, to build this stuff from the ground up, we want this in schools. We want this type of, uh, uh, I, again, like people say, it's revising history. You're like, no, we're just looking at the real history that's been sanitized. Yeah. Because a lot of kids say Canadian history is so boring. I'm like, yeah, it is boring because all the interesting stuff has been sanitized and <laughs> it's been taken cleaned, out. It's yeah. been taken out. Yeah. So let's talk about the really interesting stuff and 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 let's uncover it. And and because they're like, oh, it's going to make the kids upset. Oh, it's going. And you see what's happening yeah. in the states yes. now. Yeah. You know, we're like banning books actively. Yeah. They did that here. They just didn't. And it just like it just didn't mention it because if you look at the history books from one century, two centuries ago, um, you're going to find like there's nothing in it. Yeah. It's it's so you know the internment of the Japanese twenty thousand Japanese Canadians during World War Two were put into um, internment camps in the interior of BC. I knew this, but when I went to grade school and high school, you know, never learned it, you know, and, I, and there, as a young Japanese kid in Hamilton, Ontario, you know, my parents, my, my name is Warren, you know, my brothers are Ron and Bob. We were given the whitest names so we wouldn't rock the boat, that we wouldn't, you know, cause a fuss. So I wasn't in the advocacy mindset that I see our young people today a part of, and that's such a, powerful thing to see and uh, uh projects like a black and origin story i think will just add to their 
um, um, ability, their their knowledge of what's happening, and it's 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 as important as entertaining people, educating them with the right stories. So thank you for putting that together. Um, you know, I, there's so many other things I want to ask you and talk to you about, but I'll bring it back to love, sex, and eating the bones, and I'll and I'll do this in a bit of a revisionist way. It's 2022, uh, love, sex, and eating bones. I guess we should have done it next year when it would be like a 20 year anniversary of it. But uh, hey, we're, we're, we're 19 years out. You probably shot it in 2002, right? So it, it, I, I think we're around there for 20 years. What would the 2022 version of love, sex, and eating the bones be for filmmaker Sud Sutherland? If you could revisit it now and, and, and tell its story, what would that story be? This is weird because like we were taught, like we had consciously not wanted to do a computer version of this, right? Yeah. So like streaming and, and stuff was just beginning. It yeah. was, wasn't really happening, but you could sort of watch a video on online, online at yeah. that when we were, when we were doing it. But it email was, was yeah around. It was definitely yeah, around, yeah. but it was like, it wasn't like, it was like you'd have to like wait to the video loaded, mm -hmm. right? So <laughs> yeah. like you have to wait. And so it was like, would we want to do that story? Like the guy in front of his computer, that's like, as I, I said at the time, like that's cinematic death, right? You know, <laughs> and then because uh, we were talking with like Jonathan Duick and we'd like basically shot the whole movie, storyboarded the whole movie to convince Telefilm to, you know, and, and the other investors to give, a, give us some money. money, right? And so um, we were like, mm, yeah, I don't want to shoot that with this, with this screen like this. I, it, we, we wanted to make it alive. And so that's why we had a the, the his fantasy woman embodied in, in as his phantom. Yes, you know you have a great and, CG sequence of coming around the, the TV. Um, you know this is like Fincher esque, right? Panic Room and and um, uh, Fight Club, uh, mm -hmm. bringing those elements in. Uh, but w would you change any of the relationships now? I'm sure we'd have more like LGBTQ content. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I think probably, and then I don't know how much though. Mm -hmm. Like difference, like we would change the relationships in the movie because I kind of still like they're still there in, right. in the world. So I'm not sure how much we would ch like. We'd alter it probably slightly, well, but maybe maybe yeah. a sequel then. Maybe just catching up <laughs> with what Jasmine catching and Michael are doing. My oh my god! Yeah, that probably not together. Maybe together. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like co-parenting. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Like, it's funny. Like we, we, you know, we kind of don't revisit these things. Right. Like, um, but I, we should, you know, but I think like ultimately this story still, it's still today. Mm -hmm. Like we've got like lots of guys who are like totally in the, like addicted to porn. We've got like women who are now addicted to porn. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, there's a huge bunch of like sort of advocacy and, and people sort of, you know, recovering from porn addiction mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, it's a huge problem. Sure. So it's, it's now with us more than ever. And we were kind of like at the leading edge of that. Um, we back were, in 2003. Back in 2003. But we, you know, again, we weren't trying to like, this is the, you know, we've got to stop the, we, that was not what we were trying to do. We were trying to sort of, a hey, shine a, 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 put a window to it or shine some light on something. But I think that a lot of the relationships and a lot of stuff still holds up. And still, like one of the things is like the humor for me, like still a lot of it still holds up because we were trying to work not just within the frame, but deeper in the frame. Right. And the whole goal was to have like not just the one level of Something interest. Something happening in the background. But two and yeah. three levels yeah. of interest in the frame so that you could watch it uh, for a second and third viewing. Like, oh, and discover stuff. So yeah. that was one thing I still try to do in filmmaking, especially with, if I ever have a chance to do any kind of comedy stuff, right. to try to create three levels of interest. Um, it's, and it's, it's not always easy to do, um, and it's, you know, but it's like you want to do that. Like Mrs. Maisel uh, yeah. does that very yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, and they do it with sound as well. So, I mean, I, I, that's a- You did it in Ginny and Georgia. I mean, I think yeah. I texted you when I was <laughs> watching your episode on TV that overhead shot that was just the it, it was just a brilliant uh, a cut and I was so excited I just texted you she's like dude that's awesome <laughs> um, well keep inspiring us keep making uh, the stories you want to tell and uh, thank you for spending the time 
in the middle of your post of Black and Origin Story, which everybody must tune in and watch. Uh, what's anything else that's coming up next for you? Um, well, it's trying to get back to comedy, trying mm -hmm. to get back to features. We got a feature called Operation Red Dog, trying okay. to uh, looking at a group of KKK neo Nazis who try to take over a small Caribbean island. <laughs> and it's actually a true story it happened in Toronto. Wh what year? <laughs> This is 1979. Oh my God. 1979 to 1981. Yeah. I can't, uh, I can't wait for that one. <laughs> uh, thank you everybody for tuning in in the Canadian Film Fest land. Thank you DGC Ontario for sponsoring this talk. Uh, I wish we can go on uh, longer, but uh, Suds has to go back and keep writing his <laughs> neo-Nazi, <laughs> what, what's it, uh, KKK? Neo-Nazi. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, Operation Red Dog. That's gonna come into a, Theater near you. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right.